But Traverse City is a tough place to do ministry. Uh, you heard me say over the summer that according to Barna, the Barna Research Group, the Traverse City Cadillac Corridor, kind of this, this part of the state, is the 14th most dechurched city in the United States. And what that means is, what it means to be dechurched is that it, it's not that you're unchurched, that you've never been reached, that you've never been a part of the body of Christ, that you've never attended church somewhere or participated in the body of Christ. To be dechurched is, is it means you once attended and for, for whatever reason you no longer do, all right? Like at all. Like you're not even a, what we call them, C&E Christians, you know, Christmas and Easter's or something like that. You're not even doing that. You're just not participating at all. You no longer consider yourself a part of a church at all, although you once did. And in the, in the percentage of people in our area who are de-churched, Traverse City and Cadillac together are right up there with major cities like San Francisco and Portland. In fact, San Francisco leads the country in both de-churched and unchurched uh, uh, people. But uh, Traverse City and Cadillac are right up there with much, much bigger areas and bigger cities. And what that means is that our, our area is actually a mission field. But it's a really, really tough mission field. You see, almost half the people who live in and around Traverse City and Cadillac, 40% to be exact, 40% of the people around here are de-churched. That means the body of Christ was once a significant part of their lives, but they've made a conscious decision to part ways with the church. And I'll tell you, that's a tough person to reach uh, again. Now, many of these people still consider themselves Christians in some sense, but they no longer want anything to do with the church, which is the body of Christ. And we live in a world open to and embracing spir of, of spirituality, including Christian spirituality, but we also live in a world that's increasingly skeptical of any, any semblance of institutional religion. Now, some of these people have left because they were hurt by the church, maybe through a painful and divisive conflict, maybe because they disagreed with someone about something that they were really passionate about. For some, they may have been treated poorly uh, in the church. Others have left because they were hurt by the church. A pastor or another church leader did something that was hurtful, ab abused their authority in some way. And for others, the church, the body of Christ, has simply become irrelevant, insignificant to the lives they're living today. Churches become boring and irrelevant to them, and, and some others no longer participate because everyone's just so darn busy that they just don't have time, and, and, and it's not up high enough on their list of priorities to, to make it important for them to be there. They're fine with church, but they just don't make it a priority. And for many, the sexual abuse scandals in both the Catholic and Protestant churches have rocked our culture in recent years, and it's created suspicion and, and rejection of the church, not just in those who are directly impacted by this unconscionable abuse, but by those who aren't directly impacted, but who read and see the stories in the news. And what all of that means is that we live, we, as a church, we live and, and minister for Christ in an area in which a large percentage of the people have made a conscious decision to reject the body of Christ for some good reason. Now, there are some churches that are growing and some that are actually reaching new people or, or some of the de-churched for Christ. They're doing that. But in large part, in this area, churches are growing at one another's expense. So one church gets the hot hand for a while, and Christians kind of flock to that church. And they leave where they are worshiping, and they go to that church, the hot church, the in church. And then another church gets the hot hand, and more move to that church for a while. So let me show you how this works. I was going to do this with M&Ms, but I thought better of it because of all the illness going around. But I'm going to ask, Carol, can I borrow a few pieces of candy from your, uh, from your uh, little tub there? Carol's our church candy lady. She's the reason we all have diabetes. <laughs> so, I need four volunteers. John, Bob, Joe, Mary. Come on up here. 
It does, kind of. Well, we have Mary, the mother of Jesus. We have Joseph, the father of Jesus. We have Bob. I don't know if there's a Bob in the Bible. <laughs> no, there's not. But we have John. We could, you know. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you each, have you each take like four pieces of candy. And they're all wrapped. These are all wrapped pieces. John likes the, the butter ones. All right, here, take four pieces of candy. Okay. Four pieces of candy. All right, good. Now, Mary and Joe and Bob and John each represent a different church in our area, and they each ha- and the candy represents us because we're all so sweet. And um, so they each have their group of people. But let's say that that the church of John hires a hot new pastor, and he's really dynamic, and he's a really good communicator. No. He's a really good communicator, and he's been, he's like got a radio ministry, or, uh, he does a podcast, for those of you, we gotta, we gotta be a little bit relevant here, so the kids are like, what's a radio? Um, he does a podcast, and he's written some books, and he does all that, so a few people from each of the other churches, uh, they, they and, and, and Joe's church really takes a hard hit, because they, these people really don't like the, the pastor at Joe's church. And, uh, and so, so now we've got all these people over here, and it looks like this church is doing a really good job, but really all we're doing is shuffling the deck, right? But then Joe's church, you know, they go out and they hire a really, really young, cool, um, hip worship leader, right? I mean, he's got the hair thing going, and, and he's not the same age as the boiler in the church, and... Uh, <laughs> which our worship leader is. That's how, you know, we communicate our need for a new boiler. And uh, so some of the people from Mary's church, actually all the people from Mary's church wind up going up. You're going to get candy, don't worry. I have to say a word, don't get me. All right. Now a few of the people, now they, they come over here, and so we, we still have a healthy church over here. It's lost a few people, but it's still healthy. It's still, you know, it's still got people and money and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and this, Joe, the church of Joe, that's kind of a scary thought, um, is, uh, is really got a lot of people. And, and Bob is hanging in there, but, you know, not very many people at all. And now, and now this, we had a church that had to close its doors. Okay. Is it okay if I let each of them have one? All right, so put your, put your candy back. And to thank you for, I was, like I said, I was going to do this with M&Ms, but yes. I th- so grab a, bra- grab a candy, take it back to your seat. Thank you guys for helping me out. So that's, that's often how the church is, uh, and thanks, you guys can be seated. That's how, and thank you, Carol. <clears throat> I would give Carol candy, but, uh, you know, she already has it. So that's how we often um, grow as churches, not just in this community, but around the world. So let me ask you, has the church in the region really grown at all when that happens? No, what are we doing? We're just trading people around. There was a point uh, where I was at a meeting with several pastors in the community, and one of the pastors was the lead pastor at at um, at Westside Community Church, and one of the pastors was a, uh, the pastor of uh, the church that at the time was Bay Points, now Kensington, and they were saying that they figured that between the two of them, there were a good seven or 800 people who went back and forth between their churches every couple of years, and they could actually put a number to it, that they figured that that was just the, you know, so you feel good about what you're doing when people are pouring in, and you feel bad about what you're doing when they're not, um, but, I mean, I mean so, like, Bob's church is just is kind of holding its own, but it, it didn't have the momentum of church one, and its worship wasn't as slick as the worship in church three. And, and so the few remaining people at a church like that begin to wonder, what's the point? Now, the few unchurched reach for Christ, and some of those probably barely cancel out any newly de-churched, you know, new commitments to Christ who are just... Uh, <clears throat> um, 
you know, the, these newly de-churched and the few unchurched that are reached, they probably cancel each other out. So no, the church, the body of Christ in the area isn't growing, even though some churches may be growing. What they're really doing is drawing Christians from other churches. And they're not doing this consciously, and they're not doing this intentionally. The problem isn't with the churches. The problem is with the believers who just want to go to the hottest church. And that doesn't mean some new people are, are never being reached. It just means that a large percentage of the growth individual churches experience isn't from people coming to Christ. It's from American consumer Christians shopping for new churches. Now, let me be clear. I'm not saying that all of the bigger churches are just stealing from other churches. I'm not criticizing at all. Nor am I saying it's wrong to leave one church for another. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that when you look at a church that looks really hot, you have to look more closely, a lot more closely, at, at, at their growth and where it's coming from to really determine how a church is doing. And momentum plays a huge role in church growth in our culture. And what all that means is that this area, with so many de church people who want nothing to do with the church anymore, it can be a tough and a frustrating and a disheartening place to be the church, especially if we're constantly comparing ourselves to others. So shortly after the time of Christ, the ancient city of Philadelphia, located in Asia Minor, part of the Roman Empire, not, Philadelphia, not Pennsylvania, was frustrating. It was a frustrating and difficult place to do ministry to. Turn with me to Christ's brief letter to that church, and it's recorded by St. John in Revelation 3, verses 7 through 13. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews but are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Neither shall he go out of it, never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." Now, Philadelphia was the youngest of the seven cities uh, to whose churches these seven letters in Revelation 2 and 3 were, written, were sent, but it was no less significant than the others. It was situated on a popular trade route into the heart of the Roman Empire from some of the outer territories, and the people there flourished, but the church there struggled. You see, this is the church to which Jesus said, I know that you have but little power. Now, the church in Sardis, which was a city close by, looked like a powerhouse, but Christ said it was really dead, asleep, accomplishing nothing of significance for the kingdom of God. But unlike that, the church in Philadelphia was small and insignificant. She felt like she had little impact on her culture, uh, like her ministry didn't matter all that much. Like she wasn't doing all that much. It seemed that she was too small and too weak to do anything of significance. Not enough people, not enough money, not enough ministries. She didn't compare well to the church in Sardis. So no significant impact, right? Now, I want you to notice something about these seven letters. And that's that they were all sent to all seven churches. Right? So each, each one is addressed to a specific church. But at the end of each one, Christ says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So they all got all of these with the rest of the, the letter, the book of Revelation. 
So the church in Philadelphia is reading about the church in Sardis, and the church in Sardis is reading about the church in Philadelphia, and they're seeing what Christ is saying, not just about them themselves, but about the churches in other areas as well. This was intended to encourage the church of Philadelphia. You see, Jesus, this church in Philadelphia, Jesus says, I see that you have little power. You don't have a lot of influence. You don't feel like you have a lot of strength, but not so fast. You see, in general, these letters from Jesus to these churches contain both praise and criticism, but two of the letters are different. The letters to the church in Smyrna and the church in Philadelphia contain absolutely no criticism at all. Encouragement and and praise, but no criticism. You see, the church in Philadelphia, like the church in Smyrna, had come under persecution. Jesus said, I know you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. They were being pressured to deny the name of Christ. They were coming under persecution. And the two persecuted churches are the only two to receive no criticism. Far from harming the church, persecution has only ever strengthened the church. Now look at verse 8. That's the one I've been quoting from. I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Even though she was small and seemingly insignificant, this church hadn't given in to the pressure to deny the name of Christ, to recant her faith and worship the emperor and the false gods of the trade guilds. She hadn't given in to to the temptation to live a Christ and kind of life. You know, worship Christ and the emperor. Worship Christ and the other false gods of the trade guilds. See, the Romans were fine with whatever religion you wanted, right? So long as you didn't claim that yours was the only way. That's what they didn't like. As long as you were willing to live and let live, they were happy. But when Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. He didn't say, I am a way and a truth and a life, which is what the Romans were wanting people to to say. When he said, I am the way, the truth, the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. The believers in Philadelphia took his message to heart. They knew that God was calling them to not to live a Christ and kind of life, but to live a Christ alone kind of life. And so together they lived Christ alone lives at great cost to themselves. And they maintained their ministry and they kept doing what they were doing. To humanize, this church was no powerhouse. She was small and weak and insignificant, but she'd kept the word of God and hadn't caved to the pressure to deny Christ. I mean, look at how Christ revealed himself to this church. Look at verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. The one who is holy and true. To be holy is to be set apart from all the others. And they worshiped Christ as one set apart, different from all the others. Not one of many, but the one and only way, truth, and life. The only way to enter God's presence. That's what it means for him to be holy. To be true has has two possible meanings, and both come into play here. One is to be genuine, the real deal, authentic. Christ, the one this insignificant little church was holding on to for all they were worth amid great pressure to turn away from Christ like from Christ, he really was the way and the truth and the life. The people of Philadelphia were were fine with them saying he was a way. They weren't okay with them saying he was the way. But Christ's followers in Philadelphia simply refused to cave in, even though their lives would get much easier and much more prosperous if they did. And that's a great temptation. When your prosperity is at risk and, and at some points even your life is at risk, it's a powerful temptation to just say, no, I don't want anything to do with it anymore. But he's the holy one set apart from all the others. And he's true. He's genuine, the real deal. But there's a second meaning of true, and that, that, word, that meaning is to be faithful. 
To be true is to be faithful, to follow through on your promises, to follow through on your word. And Jesus is the Holy One, set apart as the way, the truth, the life, and He is the true one, authentic and faithful. And He would hold on to them just as they were holding on to Him. He wasn't going to let them go. Look at verses 9 and 10. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you because you have kept my word about patient endurance. And I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to, those who, to try those who dwell on the earth. You see, not only was the culture pressuring believers in Philadelphia to deny Christ, the Jewish synagogue in Philadelphia had kicked any Jewish followers of Christ in Philadelphia out. So the pressure to conform, to deny Christ, was coming from everywhere. And it wasn't peer pressure, it was lethal pressure, with the threat of poverty at best and deadly force at worst behind it. But look, look at the holy and true one's promise to them. I will keep you. In my notes, I wrote those words in this way. I wrote them with each word capitalized, uh, and and then I wrote them this way, I, period, will, period, keep, period, you, period. You know, in modern text communication, we have to come up with ways to emphasize what we're trying to say. And, 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 and when we type a text in that way with a period after each word and each word capitalized, it's one way of emphasizing the trustworthiness of the words we text to someone. It, it, it's a way of emphasizing that I really mean this. If we want them to understand the words as, ab- the, as absolute validity, The absolute truth of whatever it is we're texting, we can put a period after each word, kind of like underlining in written text, but I think the period after each word in some ways is more powerful because there's a finality to a period used in this way. It says, don't even think of questioning what I'm saying here. Don't argue with me. I will keep you. Remember, Christ has already told them that he is both holy and true, authentic and absolutely, unequivocally faithful to them. And then he says to them, don't worry, I've got you. I will keep you. Powerful words to a congregation that looked around and saw herself as insignificant in the face of the opposition she was facing. How can we ever make a difference here? But Jesus says, I've got you. I've kept you till now. I am keeping you right now. And I will keep you tomorrow and in all of your tomorrows. I've got you. It means, first of all, that those who said their faith wasn't really anything and that they weren't effective, in this case, the Jewish synagogue in Philadelphia, were wrong. That the opinions of others, the view of others, was wrong. He said, I've got you. And unlike the church in Sardis, which we looked at a couple of weeks ago, that looked really, really good and really, really powerful and really, really strong, and Christ looked at them and said, you're dead. It's like you're sleeping. You're not doing anything. He looked at this teeny tiny little church in Philadelphia and said, I've got you. Keep doing what you're doing. And back up in verse 7. On top of telling them that he's holy and true, the holy and true one, Jesus tells them that he has the key of David. And that he, that doors he shuts, no one can open, and doors he opens, no one can shut. In other words, he holds the keys to the kingdom of God. The Jews in Philadelphia were telling these Jewish Christians in Philadelphia that they were no longer a part of the kingdom of God, that they were kicked out. That this reality that they'd known their whole lives was no longer true of them. And the people who lived in the city, the people at large, the community at large was pressuring them, just knock it off. 
Just worship the emperor. Just participate in the trade guilds. Just conform. Or you're going to risk poverty and imprisonment or death. And, and you can see that they, why they would be discouraged. Our, our, our city doesn't want us. The Jewish synagogue doesn't want us. We're just over here in this little corner and, and we're doing the best we can. And that's one of the two churches that Jesus does nothing but this for. Don't be discouraged, Christ said. I hold the, king, the keys to the kingdom of God, not them. It's for me to say who is and who isn't part of the kingdom of God, not any human being. It's for me to say who, you know, I'm the, I'm the Lord of the church. It's for me to say who's effective and who isn't, not any of you. So you just keep holding on to me. I've got you. And it means that in the midst of some less than spectacular circumstances as a church, God would continue to hold on to them. So they could continue to patiently endure under pressure. Patient endurance. That's what Christ called them to. Just keep going. Discouragement comes easy sometimes, doesn't it? I know those who coordinate our community meal here at Christ Church, they face discouragement sometimes. Especially when, when people don't sign up to serve the meal to help. And those who serve get discouraged because they do it month after month after month. And it's easy to say, we're just a small, insignificant church. Who are we to think that we can keep operating a meal at this scale in the food pantry three days a week? Really? That's what we're trying to do? Are we nuts? I mean, some larger churches open their pantry like one day a week or even one day a month or two days a month. And others don't even mess with the food pantry. There are churches 10 times our size who donate food to us every once in a while for our food pantry. But why don't they set aside some time and space and run a pantry and let us collect food for them for a while? Christ's answer is simply this. They're doing what I've asked them to do. You do what I've called you to do. Keep opening up your doors and feeding the hungry and the homeless. Patient endurance just keep going. That is a task that I've given to you. So Margie Ann, who's flat on her back sick this morning, and Linda, who's picking up turkey dinners right now, and Christ Church, patiently endure. Keep serving meals. Keep opening up. And the Goodwin family will be there on the second Saturday of every month as captains. Why? Because we're all in this together. We're Christ's church together. How many of you, the song from High School Musical just hit your head? Right? I know it's a dim for Susan. I won't sing it. It's, we're all in this together. And this is our ministry right now. And Jesus has us. Look at verse 11. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. We hold on to him as he holds on to us. And then look at verses 12 and 13. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write him... Write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down from my God out of heaven. In my own new name, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Look at the promise God has for those who overcome. In this instance, those who patiently endure. The church that knows no security and stability at all will actually be a secure pillar in the temple of God. And God writes his own name and the name of his kingdom on us. In other words, he claims us. He puts his brand on us. 
just as we don't quit and haven't denied him, so he won't deny us. He says, I will keep you, so patiently endure, hold fast. I read this week about a a crazy race in the mountains of eastern Tennessee. It's held every year. It's called the Barkley Marathons. It's plural. And it's 100 miles through the mountains with nothing but a map and a compass to find your way. There aren't cops out there telling the runners where to go and stuff. You get a map and a compass and a list of rules, <laughs> and that's it, all right? Runners don't flock to this race. In fact, none of the 40 runners who attempted the most recent one uh, completed it. None of them. The mountains won, said Gary Cantrell, who created the event back in 1986. I was pleased with the outcome. This is a sadistic race planner. Like, I don't, I, the, the less people that finish it, actually, I'm happy. I was pleased with the outcome. It's a competition between the humans and the mountains. In 30 years, about 1,100 runners have tried this race. 14 have completed it in 30 years. There may still be some out there lost. With a finisher rate of about 1%, the Barkley has been labeled by many as the world's hardest race. And along with a handout that includes race directions, participants are only allowed to use a map and a compass to find their way. There are no medical stations on the course, which covers more than twice the elevation gain of Mount Everest. And over the full 100 miles, what they do is five 20-mile treks around the course. Okay? Nikki Rand was a 40-year-old Australian uh, who was an assistant professor of education in Canada, and she tried the race. She completed one and a half out of the five 20-mile laps this year before she quit. She said, you don't come here to be victorious. You come here to be humiliated. It's lonely out there. It's eerie. You have to be comfortable being inside your own head. Everyone comes back from this one pretty broken. It's a competition between the humans and the mountains, and in most cases, the mountains win. Yes, we are surrounded by mountains. And yes, we minister in a uniquely difficult place to minister. Not the most difficult, but a difficult place as our culture goes. We are surrounded by de church people who no longer want anything to do with the church. Some of whom have very negative views of the church. So what does Christ say to us? He says, I've got you. I will keep you. So patiently endure. Hold fast to what you have because you belong to me. You belong to me. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this encouraging word from your word this morning. I thank you that you, in fact, do have us, that you have called us to minister in a beautiful place that also happens to be, in many ways, a difficult place to be a church. So, Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us, that you would give us the ability to patiently endure when discouragement would seek to find its way into our hearts. We pray that we would be encouraged, that we would encourage one another, and that we would continue to do the work that you've called us to do. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.